Right, just as introduction, we've got four esteemed members of the West Harland Way family uh, here on, on, the, on our chairs. Um, Ian Beatty, who's our race director that, that I'm sure everybody knows. Ian has run the race eight, well, he's finished eight times. You might tell you about one or two of his failures as well, with a best time of 21 hours, 11 minutes, and 38. We've got Lucy, who we've also already met. Uh, met. Can anyone tell me her time? Anyone remember from Adrian earlier? 17, 16, and 20 seconds, okay, which is still the female record. And we've got uh, Rowan, Rowan or Rowan, what do you like? Depends if it's Scottish or English. Okay. Either, either, oh. either way. Okay. <laughs> Rowan. Okay. Rowan won the race last year in a time of 15 hours, 14 minutes, and 42 seconds, which puts him fourth on the overall list. And I think, I reckon there's about 1,429 people who've done it at least once, and you're fourth on that list. So, well done. And if you add up Rowan's time and Lucy's time, it comes to 32 hours, 31 and 02. And that's still faster than Kirsten's time. <laughs> I'm exactly twice Lucy's time. Oh, I think you're twice her age then. <laughs> right. So last year, Kirsten finished in 34 hours, 21 minutes, and three seconds. And I had the privilege of, of interviewing Kirsten over the, the, the build up to the podcasts. And I must admit, I had a tear in my eye when you finished, and a lot of people did as well. Just the, the effort that she put in to finish was uh, commendable. Now, I've got one question to start with, and then we'll take questions from the audience. As a way of introducing yourself, can you tell me what is so special to you about the West Highland Way race? And if we could start with Ian, please. I think for me, it's the people. I think I come away from every weekend in Fort William and just think it's, it's been like being in a bubble of, of special people in a special place. People who are doing it because they want to. That includes everybody. It's the, it's the runners, it's the volunteers, everybody associated with race and support. And it's just, I sometimes shake my head and go back to real life after that. I would say the same. It's the generosity of the people that you meet. Uh, I would say for me, I, I love the course. I think it's a, an amazing thing to go from the city of Glasgow or just outside and end up in the Highlands. So uh, that's what's always attracted me to the West Island Way. I've got my own microphone. Um, <laughs> it, it changed my life. And I just realized that I can do anything that I want to do apart from lose weight. Um, and everything in my life, I'm so content with my life now because I know that if I didn't want to be working where I am or married to my long-suffering husband, I can change any of it because I ran 97 and a half miles. <laughs> well, I, I walked quite a lot of it, but it's, it is life-changing. It's You'll not know till you're at the other end. And you'll still not know for a wee while after it. And then you'll just realise it's amazing. We're all amazing. I'll be greeting in a minute. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. So, yeah, round of applause. Good. Okay, now it might be that you've got a particular question for a particular member of the panel, or you might have a general question that we'll ask all four to answer. But if you can just put your hand up and Adrian will come and we'll get the first question in the middle there. Hello, could I ask Kirsten a question, please? Was there any point when you were completing it that your mind was taking over, telling you no, or did you have a really strong mental attitude for the whole day? I was. A I had timed out at the fling at Ben Glass, and I was really, really worried, and I fell apart leading up to it. I was really panicking, and I had a rotten race up to Ben Glass. I was sick. I was miserable, but I just kept going, and I went up over the Angels Playground. I remember going up past Dario's post, and I was saying, Dario, I've never met you, but if you're hanging about, now would be a good time. Um, <laughs> I could be doing Remy Miracle. And then the sweeper came out at Ben Glass 
And I thought, that's him, he's coming out to tell me I'm out. And he said, no, keep going, you can do this. And I came round the corner and John Duncan's shouting to me, get your arm out. And I'm running down with my arm out to get my timer thing done. And I made it with 18 seconds. And I was like, fuck, now what am I <laughs> I think my whole body, was, I was convinced I was out, and I wasn't, and it just took me a wee while to actually get my head around it, but after that, once I got with my crew, I handed over all the thoughts to them, I didn't even, I just plodded on, and I just let them do all the worrying after that, because um, I usually worry, but because I'm so far at the back, I've always got to watch that I've got my times that I'm not getting too slow but this time I just handed it over to them and I'm like no you know what you deal with it I'm just I'm just keeping plodding on and that was basically what I did so excellent thank you thanks for the question yep hi there is a, a question for Rowan and I think Lucy had mentioned uh, a banana and probably a couple of jelly babies or something but I'm really interested in what kind of nutrition you, you know you use during the race um, you know people can eat what they want I can I'm not not very good at eating during these kind of longer events so I'm just interested to see what your kind of eating plan was uh, so my plan was to eat solid foods for as long as I could uh, it lasted about 10 hours I think Bridge of Orkey uh, maybe I I can't remember how long it was until then. I, I, I told my team I couldn't eat, eat anything anymore, so I was jails from then on. Uh, I don't know why. I know some people doesn't agree with some people, but I can I can drink gels uh, all day, and it doesn't affect my stomach. And uh, I guess I'm lucky in that respect. Um, and also uh, go electrolyte um, to drink, uh, which I got quite a few calories in that way as well. In terms of being able to accept things on your stomach, I would recommend running really, really hard and then trying to eat then. I think it's more the intensity that will um, upset your stomach. So if you're running kind of two hours uh, at marathon pace and then try taking on fluids and gels, then that'll give you some experience of how your stomach's going to feel uh, after 10 hours, because you probably won't get 10 hours of running and then nutrition. Um, salt. Uh, you said electrolytes, but I went for Marmite. But you absolutely crave salt because if you have gels or sweets or jelly babies or whatever, is, you need salt. And so anything like um, bashed up crisps, because then it's less, they're already bashed up and they're easy to swallow and just take something that you don't have to chew. Um, but yeah, you, you'll really need something salty. And soup's quite good, like for later in the race, because I'm the opposite from you. I went probably like gels, milkshakes, sweets, and then I was like, I just need real food. So as long as that's somewhere in your 100 pound shop, <laughs> get some soup. Can I just ask as well, just on that, have you found it makes any difference what pace you're going at? Whether you can eat, you know, if you're really pushing it, is 100%. it hard? 100%, yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, if I were, yeah, like if you're out for a gentle, slow, chatty race, you could have like, I was about to say ham sandwiches and vegetarian, but you can have whatever you like. But if it's the intensity, you de well, every, you'll know that your stomach's just shut down, like all the blood's going to your essential organs. Um, yeah, it, it's totally intensity. So something that you don't have to swallow, um, yeah, and that's not going to make you feel sick. Okay. Anybody wants to add, Kirsten, Ian? Could I just say yep. I had a slightly different approach? <laughs> <laughs> now, why does that surprise me? <laughs> yeah. You're probably going to sort of see why I'm twice Lucy's size here. Um, I stopped at Pizza Hut at Bears Den on the way up. <laughs> And I got them to cut it into lots of wee squares. <laughs> and basically, I did the West Island way and wee squares of Pizza Hut pizza um, and party ring biscuits. Um, I couldn't get my faithful Jaffa cakes down me. Um, but hey, my Pizza Hut was great. I did actually ask my brother to get me a black pudding supper at Tindrum. But by the time I got to Glencoe, it was just, it was only some of the chips because it just wasn't really doing it for me. Um, but I'm not hey. sure if that was the advice you were after, really. Although yeah. the Pizza Hut pizza actually was a stroke of inspirational genius because it covered salt, fat, carbohydrate. And I did get them to cut it into tiny squares so as I could just take a wee toti square and keep going. You know, they looked at me as though I was daft in Pizza Hut, but um, that kind of happens all the time anyway. So. <laughs> Ian, do you want to add anything? 
I, I would just add, I, th I think everybody's completely different in this. I've, I, at one stage, really struggled and I got a nutritionist involved and it didn't really help. But the story I, I like about nutrition is one of the, one of the guys used to be a great 24 hour runner and Adrian, Adrian will know well, he turned up for a 24 hour race for a British team and he had a box of 24 donuts and he was going to take one every hour. And that was his nutrition. So I think I it's just, you've got, you've got to try, you've got to try what works for you. <laughs> Okay, next question, please. Over there, thanks, Adrian. You're working hard here, Adrian. <laughs> Is this a friend of yours, Kirsten? Used to be. <laughs> So, remembering that what happens on the trail stays on the trail, okay, can you give any advice to first-time crew who may have to go that step beyond? Brace yourself. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I see a lot of people being total divas and need their feet rubbed and they need their hands held at appropriate moments and all sorts. My crew had me well warned. Um, my brother's six foot five. He faints at the sight of blood. So I was told I wasn't allowed to get blood on me or vomit. Kirsty said she would walk if I vomited. So I spent the whole time from when I got them saying, thanks very much, thanks very much, thanks very much. Oh, I'd love a cup of tea, thanks very much. Um, I wasn't allowed to be a diva. Um, and it was okay. Because you know what, I was out in the dark for so long when I was going to the toilet and things like that. There was nobody about, so. <laughs> I could say that if you're needing to go, if say you've broken something and you need emergency medical help, drop your drawers, because the minute your drawers are down, <laughs> six hikers are gonna come round the corner. <laughs> um, every bloody time. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> the other three, anything you want to add about crews and about sort of um, support teams? <laughs> I think I've said what I need I know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'd say no, no, your runner. My support team, they knew me really well. I'd be there for your safety, I guess, and ask them how they're running, how, ask them how they're going. Because uh, I didn't tell them. I just basically ran in, grabbed some gels, and tried to run off again. But it's good for you as a runner to be able to say how you're going, and uh, good for you as a support crew to ask them, because um, they'll be worried about you. I, I think it's probably worth... The one, the one point I would make is, from observing people, Folk are generally very, they're, they're very grateful to their crew, they thank them all the time, unless it's their partner, and they're really rude <laughs> to their partner. So the one piece of advice I would give is try and be as pleasant to your partner as you are to everybody else who's crew. <laughs> Just, just one more question on the um, support. Uh, do you recommend having two teams or one team? Well, and obviously, the quicker guys, you, you know, that's fine for you. But the ones that are a bit slower, and um, do you find it best to have two teams or one? Um, I had three people in my crew. My brother didn't expect me to speak to him, so it made no odds. And Kirsty and Fiona, they just kept talking and I didn't even have to think or answer. I think if I'd had one of them, I would have felt obliged to try and hold a conversation. And Is this when they're with you? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was, it was easier. I think it's quite good if, you've, if you're slower, that you've got two people with you, because then they can talk to themselves and you just trail along behind them. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great point, actually, because it is actually hard work to talk when you're tired, isn't it? And if there's a conversation going on, you can just join in. So, yeah, that's um, a great Sorry, in terms of crew not running with you but being out there, I think lots of people, it's quite a big ask to ask two people um, to stay with you for the whole of the 24 hours or whatever. So I think it's fine to have two crews and lots of people, that's what you've got. So you're just grateful to have anyone. But as long as... It sounds really obvious, but as long as they pass on that information and maybe write things down in a wee list. So, because um, I've crewed for twice, I think, for people. Um, and yeah, so you just write down had had mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes and ketchup. <laughs> Richie won on that, and it's really, really good. Um, but yeah, just write down what they've had. And the other piece of information as a runner that is really annoying if your support crew or marshals don't know is how many miles to the next checkpoint. It sounds really obvious. Um, but your head's all over the place. And if someone says, oh, I think it might be 12, or is it 18? And you're just like, 
So really no, and also some people want to know how far ahead the next person is. So just like vaguely be aware, I would say, because that's helpful. Okay, thank you very much. The next question, please. A uh, question for Kirsten, because none of the others will probably be able to answer this. How did you cope, how did you find it, and how did you cope with running through a second night, or walking through a second night, which is probably what we both did? I found the second night really hard. I came into Glencoe just as it was getting dark, and I actually stopped for about 10, 15 minutes at Glencoe, and my nerve had gone a wee bit, gone out in the dark. Um, that was probably my low point. It just, I was worried about the devil's, devil's staircase and it turned out the devil's staircase wasn't actually the horrible bit. The horrible bit was that blooming stretched from Glencoe to the devil's staircase. Because you're just, you see the road and you see the cars and you're getting nowhere. Um, and actually the devil's staircase, it was just, well I knew I just had to start and get up it and that was it. Um, there was no option with that. Um, but it was hard. When I came into Kinlochleven, it was starting to get into daylight. And I knew at that point I would finish. I didn't know if I would make it in time to get a goblet. And I don't know, if I don't know, Ian, do you actually not get a goblet if you come in at five past twelve? You, you don't get a goblet. Right, OK. Well, just as bloody well I didn't then. <laughs> you, you, you don't get a goblet if you come in at one second past twelve. Right. I, I wasn't sure, but I did know it was the last point that I could be timed out in the course. So, but it was really weird because I was coming along in daylight and people kept saying to me afterwards, oh, do you remember all the lights at such and such? No. <laughs> do you remember the file on Davra? No. You, and it was all away because <laughs> it was daylight by the time I got there. So the second night was hard. Um, can, I haven't can stayed I, up. Can, sorry, Kirsten, can I make the point? I, I think it's something I've always said to people, particularly those in the middle of the field, is don't, don't waste the daylight. Like, you, you'll have loads of time to sleep the next week. Don't get to somewhere like uh, Glencoe and you've got an hour of daylight and you decide to have a half hour sleep. It's just daft. Keep going. Keep going as much as you can. Move forward. You're going to slow down when it gets dark. Everybody, I think, even even the guys to my right will slow down when it gets when it gets dark. But uh, just keep moving forward all the time and, uh, and, and you'll get there. You'll make progress. Okay, just to supplement that, do you think there's anything you can do to prepare yourself? When you think, Kirsten, when you look back, would you do anything differently to help you prepare? I haven't stayed up for 34 hours since I was 18. <laughs> and I can't imagine anything that I could have done to have prepared. If, and hopefully when, I do it again, I will train going out at one o'clock in the morning because my stomach was really quite unsettled and I think that's quite a common problem because it's the middle of the night um, but I can't honestly imagine how I would train to be on the go for 35 hours um, I just kept plodding on yeah. um, but I was really really glad when it got into that second daylight yeah. that was just that was a good feeling <laughs> I never slept at all and I didn't sleep I didn't even sleep we drove down to Tindrum and I was still quite awake and quite with it um, and it was only once I got home I slept but John wanted me the next day for the podcast I'm like no that'll not be happening and yet I got up the next morning I was full of joys of spring I was like oh bring it on you know um, a slight problem with my blisters but other than that I felt great afterwards I really did so it was good okay. <laughs> did you want to add anything? No, I was just asking if you were sleepy. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, th I think it is amazing when your body, the way it adjusts, isn't it? As you uh, once the daylight comes again, then it does give you a, a sort of a, 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 a new sense of uh, at least a life. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Just want to ask the panel where the other than the course, where their favourite place to train is. Okay. Favourite place to train. I did a lot up at the wind farm because it's fairly handy for me and it's similar sort of terrain um, and I also used to run to my husband's work because he works 20 miles away so I would run from my house to his work and then he would give me a lift home so that was that was pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, I train a lot in the Pentlands, just because they're on my doorstep, but I, I love to train in the Cairngorms, uh, if I can get up to the Cairngorms to run 
it's just yeah, so much more spectacular than the Cairngorms, uh, than, than the Pentlands. <laughs> Um, I'm navigationally challenged, so I would get an OS map and just look for a, like a double track somewhere. So I sometimes ran like Glen Tilt or, I mean, just anywhere, but I, I had to look for a really obvious track and then measure it. Um, yeah. But you can still get to amazing places. Right? I think that is your reputation, actually, Lucy. There was a, a comment on Facebook that uh, I think Julie put on, and Ross Morland, who's a good friend, said, I'm surprised you found a way there. <laughs> So, I gave her a lift. <laughs> so Ian, what's your favourite place to train? I'm a bit like Ron, I think the, the Pentlands are on my doorstep, I like it up there, it's, it's great. Uh, it's just finding somewhere that's the right distance. I, I, was, I always did tend to think I quite like going onto the West Highland route. I know we're on it a lot and it's fairly accessible, but I'd still use that for, probably because I know the distances, I know the times I'm running, if I'm running well there, it's quite a good marker for that. Yeah. But would, it, would it change uh, the race that you're preparing for? So if it was a, a different race to the West Highland Way, would you train somewhere differently? Probably not. Um, the wind farm's convenient, it's handy. I don't see me, I do go up to the West Highland Way because again, it's not far from my mum's, so it's, it's there and it's accessible. Um, I did, on the lead up to the West Highland Way, I went up and I wrecked the low road because I'd made that into a big challenge in my head. I'd convinced myself it was a lot harder and it was going to take me a lot longer. And it was better knowing what I was coming, what was coming with that. Um, but no, I probably, I've got the wind, I've got the biggest wind farm in Europe right in my doorstep. It's, it's not rocket science, you know. I would definitely change the training depending on the race, but that's very specific. So if you're going to go and run the UTMB, you don't train on the West Highland Way. I mean, that's obvious. So if you're going to train for hills, train on massive great mountains. And I remember doing the CCC and in the middle of it saying, I wish I'd done more hills. And the only way to do that, I mean, I've got friends that did reps of Ben Nevis, which sounds horrendous, but I mean, you really have to do like hardcore big hills. Yeah, I'd quite a, I'd a, a plan if I'd get into the, one of the UTMB races this year. I, I thought I was going to have to train differently, just get up and down hills much more than that. I think something, last year I did a couple of races which were down south. I just went on the basis of what I'd done because there was no way to wreck them. So just getting out and about. And I think the Pentlands was probably quite good for that. Uh, I wouldn't. But I probably should have done. I've done flat ultras before and done pretty terrible times. So <laughs> uh, I just tend to like to run in the hills, and the West Highland Way suits that. Yeah, I think for folks who live in Scotland and we're close to hills, it's it's great, isn't it? I do feel sorry for people who live in flat areas where they can't practice. You know, they can't train on hills. It is that much harder. Okay, next question, please. That's it. Make him run. That's good. <laughs> Um, my question is probably more for Lucy and uh, Rowan, but for, for anyone who can answer. Um, um, how do you guys deal during the race with, like, with both chasing and both being chased in terms of your like mental strategies? It's probably isn't it? Yeah. yeah I hey. like, I <laughs> how you doing? Not bad, mate. Uh, I, I tend to... You, you have to run your own race. Um, if you're chasing somebody, you're probably going to blow up. If you're being chased and you feel like you're being chased, you're the same. Um, I, I would tend to run a, um, a pace that suits me, you know, a pace that I think I can, can, can continue for the rest of the race. Uh, and if that happens to be first, second, last, then, then so be it. I think that's, that's the way I approached it. Um, any other way, and I think I would have ended up in a puddle in Kinloch or even. Um. Yeah, uh, exactly the same. I think it's... Um it might be tortoise and hare that, you know, obviously your mind's going to think, oh gosh, they're much fresher and they're going ahead. But then you never know. I mean, it's a long way, so you never know where their low point's going to come. And yours might be coming then. And, you know, so it evens out over the piece, I think. Um, and, yeah, I mean, certainly, like, really good runners who I've seen in races, and they're just, like, hanging back third, fourth, tenth. But you only know your own race. And, yeah, you can't let anyone else kind of um, interrupt that. If you're, if you're out in front, uh, do you ever look behind? No. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, so, so you're saying that you, you, you run your own race, but you are affected by people behind you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think especially in the West Highland way, I didn't expect to win it. Um, and sometimes when you're feeling bad, you'll have a little look behind and see if anyone sees how you're doing. <laughs> and if you see someone, how does, how does that make you feel? Uh, pretty terrible. Well, yeah, you're probably right. I probably do pace my race based on uh, other people, but generally I, I don't think I saw anyone in the West Island way. Um, I, I, as I said in your podcast, I didn't know I was winning it until, um, until uh, I've been winning it for 20 miles, so that made a bit of a difference. Okay. And Lucy, you never look behind. Is that a policy? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that was good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Some great questions here. You're a great audience. Well done. Um, so I've supported and marshaled on quite a lot of races and something that a lot of my friends who've run on some of the longer races um, have hallucinated. Have any of you seen a rock that was a sheep or a man about to jump out at you? And did you have any of that experience on the West LMA race? I know it's a back of the pack special thing, but it does happen on the longer distance races. I was totally stunned by why they'd put all these lorry containers up the double staircase. <laughs> and I couldn't understand why they painted a picture of William Shakespeare's face. But other than that, no, I was fine. <laughs> the, the best one I'd, I'd, I've seen, and it wasn't me, it was somebody I was running beside, and they were running along and they were sort of going... <sighs> <laughs> and I said, what, what are you doing? He said, it's the sheep, it's the sheep, the bloody sheep. <laughs> under my feet, they just thought there were sheep underneath their feet. <laughs> Actually, that's... <laughs> Do you remember when I supported for you, Donna? Do you remember when we were just after Landavra? <laughs> Oh, well, there's a lot you don't want to remember, but um, there was a whole, it was a wall, and we were all convinced it was a whole row of sheep in a row, and it wasn't, it was a wall, a dry stain wall, but it looked like sheep to me, so, and I wasn't, I hadn't been running at that point. <laughs> I, I haven't hallucinated, but I just need to tell, because it's quite a funny story, um, I was supporting, well, kind of present at an unsupported um, bike packing race across Kyrgyzstan that my husband was doing and it's something stupid like 3,000 kilometres and um, he came into the checkpoint and we said are you okay and he said I'm a French milkmaid <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm going to say <laughs> I haven't, no <laughs> I, I, think, I think probably my, my most worrying hallucination was a couple of years ago when I was driving back up the road from Kinloch Leaven to Fort William and I got round a bit just before the Corran Ferry and I saw these three people, hikers out who were crossing the road. This was three in the morning, there wasn't a soul. And I actually stopped the car and waited till they walked in front of the car <laughs> and then they went on and I realised then it was maybe time for me to have a sleep. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that is a concern, isn't it, for safety-wise, support, support people, make sure you're rested as well, and don't drive when you're overtired. Yep, next question, please, at the Frontier agent. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Hi, I was sort of, um, I met Kirsten, I was endeared to Kirsten when I swept in 2016. It was really, a, I'm a kind of flat guy, and I was, I, I was afraid to do the whole thing because of the hills, basically, because uh, I've got asthma really bad and I'm okay in the flat as soon as I go uphill. So I thought I'd sweep it and uh, that's when I met Kirsten. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. So I, I knew I knew it was going to be really tough for her and it was great to know that she finished it, but I knew it would be incredibly tight. So it's great to have a representation of the you know the panel from you know the back of the pack, the middle of the pack. And personally myself, I've been first and last in the races that I've done. So, and then everything in between. So, and all the ultras that I've done. So it's it's, it's great that I'm kind of you know I can, I, I, although I'm not a racer, I can relate to what everyone said. And my question is partially really to do with the, the technical section at Inverstead. I'm amazed at how people can get through that. Because I had to, when I swept that, I had to drag a guy through that. He, he really shouldn't have, have done that section, but because he was injured and stuff like that. But how do you go through that technically? And I, I think if, if I was to add a second part, was mentally, uh, when you get really low in a race, how 
do you deal with that? You know, because that's particularly for someone like Kirsten's at the back. There's going to be people think, oh, I can do it. It will be checkpoint chasing. Um, how do you deal with those in a race? Okay, and, well, thank you. So that technical bit from Inversnay to Ben Glass. How do you? How to do you be go? fair, that I'm not an awful lot slower than everybody else on that bit because everybody's crawling along, and it's actually. I hate it, don't get me wrong, but I'm not actually... John did one of his graphs, and I love all these statistics that he does, and he did the statistics, and it was the speed of the likes of me at the back and the fast folk, and it showed how their speed came down quite dra drastically. But I didn't get too much slower because I was so slow to start with. So when you get to the bits where you're having to hike, I can hike up the double staircase. I can hike up that bit out of Kinlochleven. I can hike along the, the technical section. And my speed's probably not an awful lot slower than the fast people at that point. It's not, you know, that's probably what saves my race. You know what I mean? Um, uh, for the for the technical sections, I would say practice. I spend a lot of time in um, independence. I, mean, I think you must be doing it fast. And I've never watched anybody through that. <coughs> Is it just just practice training? Just Bravery, <laughs> practice. Yeah. yeah. So for that section, um, would you have done that a number of times in Rowan before the race? I did it once. Uh, after listening to your podcast, I um, I realised it wasn't flat. Damn <laughs> by. <laughs> Down by Lot Lomond, so I did it at night, um, and I also hadn't done much night running, uh, as in through the night. So I went to Mulgai at ten at night and ran in, ran to Crane Larrick. Is it still dark that section when you get there? Uh, it wasn't in the race, but it was when I ran it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would say it's ankle stability. So if you you need to do lots of. Um hill because I did quite a lot of hill running really badly because um, I'm really rubbish at going downhill but um, in terms of ankle stability um, the more you do like uneven stuff and then apparently a, a few years after I did it there were some Americans that came along and they were really cross that it wasn't all like manicured trail because um, I think that trail race means different things to different people but if you run on like if you run in the Pentlands with that head torch that's really good because you can't see where you're going and it's uh, quite rooty because I fell over a wall. <laughs> I, I always find that bit really difficult. I just find I, d I don't have great balance. Uh, I, I, kind of, I kind of try to get my mind into if I'm going slowly here, I'm saving a bit for later on the bits I can run, the bits I'm a wee bit better than. So I tried not to let it bother me. It's there and everybody had to get through it. Okay, thank you. I've got one final question, but we've probably got time for maybe a couple more. So if you've got a burning question you want to ask. Uh, just a quick question for Ian. Ian, I, uh, I see you're still calling it 95 miles. 97.5 on my watch. <laughs> yes. I think that's just looking back to the, the tradition of it. I don't think... We've never really spoken whether we change it to 96 or whatever. P people... Uh, it's probably a bit longer now than 95. There's a lot of ultra marathons that aren't quite the distance. They're either slightly longer or slightly shorter. The West Highland Way has been known as a 95 mile race since it started. So I think my view would... Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, it's an interesting one. I think compared to the time when Lucy set a record, certainly, I think I think the course is quite considerably easier. I thought you were going to say I got it easy. No, no, I, I think I, I think it's quite it's quite considerably easier now. I think a lot of the paths have been smoothed out, much more runnable. Uh, I mean, the section the section used to be up up the side of some of Glen Falloch and up there was was pretty bad. There weren't the paths that are there now. So the fact we've added a wee bit on at the end, I think, kind of just compensates for that. I think there's um, there's more gates as well now, whereas before there was a lot more styles, particularly in the second half, and that makes a big difference when you've got sore legs going over styles. Yeah. Okay, anything to add? Happy that. Okay, next question, please. What? Almost there. Uh, training for the West Island Way obviously lasts a number of months longer for some people if, if you're building up to it over a races, uh, racing seasons. Um, in that year leading up to the West Island Way, is there anything that you, looking back, wish that you 
did do and maybe subsequently did in future races and something that you look back and wish you hadn't done? I wish I had run more. Um, but to be fair, I was injured. I'd hurt my shoulder um, and I couldn't run. So I did a lot of leg work at the gym. And what Lucy was saying about ankles, that helped because usually I go over my ankles and my ankles were a lot stronger. But I would have liked to have had more mileage. I felt just a wee bit too undertrained. And on the night, I was really getting myself into a panic. I thought, there's no way this is going to happen. But you know what? It's a mental thing as much as anything else. Um, you just have to get your head in the game. Um, but I would have liked to have had more miles under my belt. And a couple of stone lighter would have been a vast improvement. But hey. <laughs> It's a, hard, it's a hard one. Uh, my training changes all the time, depending on how I'm feeling, basically, and how much spare time I have. Uh, so the back-to-back the back -to -back runs, I think, were key. Um, so for me, it would probably be a three-hour independence followed by a two-hour independence Saturday, Sunday. Um, and faster runs on Tuesday, Thursday. That was what I did leading up to the West Island Way. Uh, last year and probably would have done similar uh, that would be kind of an ideal but with more of a pace um, and probably slightly slightly more miles if I could have done if I could have squeezed it in and found the time I don't think there's anything that I wish I'd done differently that I can remember but in future races um, Vaseline really helpful and it sounds I'm not being facetious because um, I actually wrote that down in the back of my diary because if you do a really long race and you don't remember to put it in the appropriate parts it's really sore um, but just that meticulous attention to detail so knowing what kit but everything from where you're going to tape and like what your rucksack is that where you can access your jelly babies and all that stuff so it's just the detail stuff and write down and if you get if you make a mistake in a race write it down and learn and don't do it again i think i would say maybe not so much from from my own but from looking at other people and from doing a bit of coaching i think we've, we've spoken a bit about overtraining and i think when i see, what i see now is people who train for ultras 12 months of the year they never have a break and i, I think physically and mentally that's not a good thing I, I tended to just break my training down into two parts so january february march which was more or less marathon training with a bit off road and then april may i got onto the trails and and hammered out the trails for these three months and i think we didn't have quite the same groups and the good fun aspect and meeting up every weekend for races but i do think people are quite mentally mentally tired and are just never taking a break from doing this so it's then getting that objective that you want to be on that start line on the 20th of June in the best shape you've ever been in your life and how are you going to be that not if you've just run a 55 minute ultra three weeks before it's not gonna it's not gonna work okay oh last question thank you before my last question yeah, it's basically just for his all in regards to we all know that after a race we get a low or we can get a bit down after races and i know from a mental health point of view that the 95 miles leading up to it is a big thing as well how have you all felt after a big long race mentally and what do you do to actually make sure that you don't have that low do you sort of surround yourself with good people and stuff but it's just i know that's something that's been apparent to a lot of people in this day and age so it was just on that side i think that's a really good question um, I, I think for about a week or a month or whatever you're living off the photos and all the chat and all the kind of residual adrenaline and shared stories it's like going to a wedding and people then take share their photos and stuff so I think that can sustain you but then when that dips then it's sometimes for some people it's signing up to another race but that's a bit obvious but yeah i guess another goal or then maybe spending time with the people that you've abandoned when you've been busy training um yeah but i think it's a really good question and i probably have a different answer in the phase i'm at now than i did like 12 years ago I think I would say that the biggest low, certainly the biggest low I ever had was in 2008 when I didn't finish the race, I dropped out and I'd finished it every year pretty much consecutively up to then for about seven or eight years and I think it was in a low for about three months after that, it really took me a long, long time to get over that 
and I think the way I did eventually was just by trying to get back into running and do other things and do do other races and it was a 24 hour race at Perth that sort of got me over that to prove to myself that I could still do these long things yeah I think uh, second what Lucy said is just savour it and enjoy it um you can set yourself this goal to to achieve something and depending on how long it's taking you to achieve I mean I think you have to take it I think I took at least a month to well before I could even run properly again to, and start official training just to enjoy and um, enjoy the things that you didn't enjoy while you were training so some drink some very bad food that kind of thing uh, and then after that month if if, um, if you still have the, the buzz and you still want to run set yourself a new goal something bigger something faster um, reflecting on back on what you've done uh, and set yourself either a new target in the same race or uh, something bigger sorry um, but controversially uh, and maybe it is just because it's been such a long time since I did it but I would uh, strongly suggest remembering that running isn't the be all and end all and I think when we're in a room like this and everybody gets obsessive about what times and what mileage and what shoe lacing strategy and all this nonsense I honestly think like sometimes just have a word with yourself um, you know it's a first world problem there's a lot of more important and other things going on in the world and it can become very self well selfish and just self-referential so if you're feeling crap um maybe it's time to step away from running for a bit and that's not a bad thing i didn't run after the west highland way for months i pulled out the devil because i just couldn't i just couldn't get myself to want to do it um and it got to about August, end of August, and I thought I need to do something here. So I actually joined the local running group, the Clannet Harriers, um, and I'm in their slow group just now, and I'm going out with the beginners, and I'm running maybe four miles a couple of times a week, but at least it's getting me going. Um, and it, I think it's just getting me out the door, because I think I could quite easily have never run again. Um, it wouldn't have broke my heart, you know. Um, but I'm slowly but surely starting to get back in there, and I'm starting to get some goals. But I didn't even enter the Fling of the Devil this year. Um, I just went a year out, you know. But I will be back. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for all your questions. They were really, really good. Right, just to finish with, I just want you to maybe just tell us what your plans are for this year. Um, don't have to be running if you don't want, Lucy. <laughs> okay. But just uh, just to finish with, just just give us a sense of what, what you're aiming to do this year. I want to win out a test B with my dog. Um, I do obedience with my dog, and I'm I'm training really hard, and she's training really hard. So Silky and I want to be we want to get some red rosettes this year. So that's that's our plan. Silky was my wee puppy at the time of my first fling, and my husband couldn't understand why folk kept running up to him and saying, "Oh my God, is this Silky?" And he was like, "Ah, who are you?" You know. <laughs> but everybody had seen Silky all over the Facebook page, so that's that's my plan with her. So that's it. <laughs> I'd like you to train my dog, please. She's uh, really in a <laughs> I'm better at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, I've just had a, just had a son, so bring up my boy um, as best as I can. Uh, Running-wise, I've, I've entered the fling, and I haven't said publicly, but I might try and bring the, run one of the big rounds. I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, I am about to retrain as a counsellor and I'm also uh, swimming five and a half miles length of Coniston in September, in theory, and it's going to be really cold. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd probably get more satisfaction now watching the people I'm coaching do. I've got, I've got one of the ladies coaching is doing our first ultra in May in Kataiwe. I'm interested to see how that goes. Some of the others doing marathons and so on. So I'm going to do Kintyre as well. Might do the Great Glen after that. I've never done the Great Glen, so we'll see. Excellent. Well, we wish you all the best with these varied uh, the tasks and things. That's great. Big round of applause, please, for our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, everyone. That brings an end to our evening. If I could just thank you all for coming along. I think it's been a great night. If I could thank all of our speakers, particularly Matt from, from Altra, Run Hill, travelled all the way up from Stockport. It's been a great uh, Thank you very much, and we appreciate the support. From Adrian, uh, Run and Become, who Adrian's organised all this, pulled it all together. So thank you very much. Uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully sometime before 20th of June, but we'll see all of you then. Thank you.